Geneva Overholzer. I'm the director of the USC Annenberg School of Journalism, and it's a great pleasure and honor for me to welcome you here tonight. We are honored, especially in the journalism school, to have on our faculty the man behind the documentary that you are about to see. Joe Saltzman is a rare and really, um, what can I say? Jack Langeth could figure it out. Unparalleled experience. <laughs> but I want to tell you how proud we are to have him and the kind of work that he has done uh, be part of our faculty and this school's experience. We in the journalism school, of course, believe that journalism can make all kinds of differences in our lives. We think that it's essential to us as self-governing people, that we live richer lives as citizens because of it. But it makes no contribution greater, in my view, than this one, shining light in dark corners and telling stories that other people don't tell. It's hard for people in this room to think about what it was like to talk about breast cancer in 1974, just as it is hard for us to remember what it was like in 1968 to talk about race. Some of you were privileged, as I was, to be here uh, two years ago. I can't believe it's two years ago when we saw um, the 40th anniversary of his documentary on, on what we call Black on Black, which enabled us to hear black voices on the black experience. And the silence that the nation had really been experiencing before that was, was deafening. Similarly, we, we now have before us a story um, that tells uh, us of something that just wasn't talked about in 1974, and that is breast cancer. One reason, of course, that stories like these weren't told is that it took not only the foresight and courage to tell them, but it took sensitivity. It took an awareness of uh, how we present issues that are painful to us as a, a society. And sensitivity is a quality that Joe, for all of his apparent curmudgeonliness, <laughs> has in spades. So I feel immeasurably lucky, Joe, to have you as my colleague. Let me note that Visions and Voices and the University of Southern California Libraries are collaborating, collaborating on something that I'm really proud of that is just new this year, and that is that they're they're publishing resource guides that build on learning experiences such as this in Visions and Voices. They've selected print and online resources to help us obtain more information about breast cancer, and copies of the library guide may be obtained upstairs or uh, upstairs at the Vision and Voices table, or you can go online and there is a URL where you can find this information. So now it is my pleasure to introduce to you my distinguished and delightful colleague, Marty Kaplan, who is director of the Norman Lear Center, which is part of the Annenberg, Annenberg family, and a research professor at the Annenberg School of Communication, where he holds the Norman Lear Chair in Entertainment, Media, and Society. Marty has done it all. He's been a speechwriter, a Washington journalist, a deputy presidential campaign manager, a Disney studio executive, a motion picture and television producer, a screenwriter, a radio host, and now he's going to come to this lecture. You may wonder why Joe needs two introductions. <laughs> so do I. Someone stole my piece of paper. Geneva, did you take my piece of paper? You did. Geneva, by the way, is an excellent dancer, if, if, if some of you don't know that. I just thought some of you should pass it. So uh, most of you know Joe as uh, a professor of journalism. In fact, are there any people here who have ever been Joe's students? Excellent. Great. Um, I know Joe as a, as a colleague at the Annenberg School and also because he runs an amazing project called the Image of the Journalist in Popular Culture for the Lear Center, which takes only about 23 hours a day of his time. <laughs> and uh, from uh, ancient cave paintings until shows <laughs> that are going to appear next week, he has tracked every single instance of journalists, I invite you to look at the amazing database. But before Joe came to USC, he led another life. He was a documentarian at CBS News. 
and in the space of 10 years, he made six amazing documentaries, which won over 50 awards. It's an incredible record. Amazing thing that people then got to have him as a teacher, hot off that experience. There are, there are five things I want you to know about Joe. <laughs> One is that he always pushed the envelope. He broke boundaries. Another is that the documentaries he made made a difference. They actually were instrumental in changing things in the world. It wasn't just an emotional, wonderful emotional experience, moving and powerful and informative, but they also changed things. He is a terrific storyteller who knows the hardest thing for any storyteller to do, and that's to get out of the way and let the story be told. He's also, as I mentioned, an incredibly hard worker. Uh, those, are, those are four of the things I want you to know. Um, he was, as Geneva said, among the first documentary makers to write and produce and report on really important social issues, like uh, the first commercial documentary on rape, which actually resulted in changes in the California law about rape. Junior High School, an important early pioneering documentary about the quality of education in our public schools. Black on Black, which uh, Geneva mentioned. And tonight, of course, uh, one of Joe's most important documentaries, Why Me? Not only was it the first documentary on breast cancer on commercial television, it also resulted in thousands of lives being saved and it advocated changes in the treatment of breast cancer in America that today are commonplace. That's amazing to be a consequence of a documentary. Why Me won 10 major awards, including three Emmys, a Golden Mike and the Columbia DuPont Award, which for broadcast television is the equivalent of a Pulitzer. Um, when uh, they gave it to him, they said, uh, in this gripping hour on breast cancer, Saltzman tread a narrow path between bathos and tragedy, which he survived with signal success thanks to his own and the participants' impeccable taste and sincerity. I'd love to see that on a wall, Joe. <laughs> and so I said there were five things I wanted you to know. I've told you four. Here's the fifth. Um, if any of you have ever received an email from Joe, you may know that at the close, you know how some people say, you know, cheers or all best or see ya or something? Uh, his emails are always signed with one single word, all in lowercase, love Joe. <laughs> and uh, the first time anyone gets it, you're kind of surprised by it, and then you kind of take it for granted. And as I was thinking about that tonight, what I would uh, encourage everyone to do, to think of that not as a closing in a message, but rather coming from us, from me to you, a kind of exhortation and imperative. Love Joe. <laughs> Joe Saltzman. I should say that I never signed Love Joe to students with the new sexual harassment policies. <laughs> I don't want to get in any kind of trouble. Thank you so much, Marty. And Geneva had to leave for another appointment, but uh, I appreciate her being here. I also want to thank USC Annenberg, as well as Visions and Voices and the USC Arts and Humanities Initiative for sponsoring this event. I want to thank USC Annenberg's Lee Warner, who did a splendid job helping me restore Why Me as well as Chuck Boyles and Jim Yoder for their help in making this video available. What I want to do tonight is to give you an inside look at how this documentary came to be and how it was put together and a sense of time and place when breast cancer was not talked about or discussed in the media. Today everybody talks about breast cancer, but in the early 1970s it was a taboo subject with the exception of a few magazines that catered to women, no one mentioned it. It was something to be discussed between a woman and her doctor and no one else. The only recommended and accepted treatment for breast cancer then was something called a radical mastectomy. 
and few women even knew what that operation was all about. Reconstructive surgery was simply not an option. I think I'm, am I working off those or this? I guess, well, why the hell didn't you tell me that? <laughs> Jesus. God. I'm going to go back to my prepared speech now. <laughs> I had just completed a 30-minute documentary on the crime of rape that Marty mentioned that was so controversial that TV Guide refused at first to list the title since the word rape was then taboo. In 1970, the crime of rape was always referred to as criminally assaulted. But the documentary became the highest rated documentary in Los Angeles TV history, and as Marty said, resulted in changes in California law regarding courtroom procedures. What I didn't know was that a group of UCLA doctors had seen the program and wanted a documentary produced that would publicize breast cancer and urge women to do something about it, to do self-examinations and to get a mammography. Their worry was that few women were getting mammographies and that the public was dangerously uninformed about breast cancer. I was reluctant to do the program. Although I had finally won approval to do the documentary on rape from the newly created National Organization for Women, who at first felt only a woman should produce the program, I didn't want to go through that hassle again. But the UCLA doctors persuaded me that a documentary on breast cancer would save many lives, and perform a real public service. So executive producer Dan Gingold and I agreed to do the program. It was a time when the mass media refused to even talk about breast cancer. An example of what I mean is that the American Cancer Society had produced a commercial urging women to perform self-examination of their breasts. The commercial consisted of a woman taking a shower, barely visible behind a thick wall of glass, while actress Tammy Grimes' voiceover urged women to check their breasts for any lumps or abnormalities. Not one station in America agreed to air that commercial. In fact, the first time that commercial was shown on American television was in our documentary. Another problem was that every doctor I talked to said their patients who had had radical mastectomies would never go on camera to talk about their breast cancer. They suggested that putting the women in shadows and disguising their voices might convince some of them to appear on the program. Being a young and cocky producer, I told them it wouldn't be a problem. All I asked the doctors for were the names of their patients and their phone numbers. I then talked to more than 150 women who at first were reluctant to even see me. But after hours of interviews, every one of them agreed to appear on the program if it would help to save lives. I finally picked nine women who appeared on the program and who agreed to candidly and without reservation discuss what they had gone through. One of the women told me, I'd rather lose an arm than a breast. This so startled me that we looked into America's obsession with breasts. What kind of society would create a situation where a woman would rather give up an arm than a breast if she had a choice? The result of our study became a prologue to the documentary that explored the reasons why breasts are, for many women and men, a definition of sexuality, femininity, and motherhood and how this affects the reactions so many people have to breast cancer and the treatments for breast cancer. Another major hurdle was persuading CBS that we should show a woman doing a complete examination of her naked breasts on camera so women would not be ashamed or reluctant to do the same thing in the privacy of their home. At first we got a solid no way. So we shot the courageous woman who agreed to do the breast examination, Barbara Essenston, two ways, one in the leotard and one naked. I will never forget the day we shot the self-examination at Barbara's house in her bedroom. There we were, four males, me, Dan who was directing the sequence, a cameraman and a sound man with lights ablaze and Barbara naked to the waist demonstrating how to do a self-examination when there was a knock on the door and one of Barbara's children opened the door. <laughs> he looked at us, staring back at him and politely asked his mother what was going on. A very calm Barbara told him that she was busy filming a documentary. He said no problem and left. <laughs> when we looked at the footage, Barbara doing the self-examination in a leotard looked obscene whereas the examination showing a naked breast 
look normal and natural, still persuading CBS to allow us to show the naked dress sequence was a constant battle. While struggling to come up with a convincing argument, I happened to watch a dramatic production on PBS of a program called Steam Bath, in which actress Valerie Perrin showed her naked breasts for about a second. We then made the argument that if PBS could show a naked breast in a dramatic production, why couldn't we show a naked breast to save lives? We finally won the day and never received one letter or phone call complaining about the self-examination. CBS, always reluctant to do the show, had one provision that management insisted upon, and that was that we had to get a female actor to do the narration on the program. That seemed easy enough, but because of circumstances beyond our control became a real problem. We had contacted Natalie Wood, a popular actress at the time, to do the narration, and she immediately agreed. What we didn't know was that a well-known Hollywood makeup artist had just died of breast cancer because she refused any treatment that might disfigure her body. We had completed the first half of the documentary, which consisted of breast cancer survivors explaining what they had gone through, intercut with a woman discovering her lump and going through a procedure. I sent the transcript of the first half of the program to Wood. What happened next was a horrendous surprise. Natalie Wood read the transcript and became hysterical, saying we could not put this on television because it was too frightening and would panic women everywhere. She then called her gynecologist, who had many celebrity clients, and convinced him to help her stop this documentary from ever being aired. She then called all of her friends and told them that they must do everything possible to stop CBS from putting this documentary on television. In those days, actress Wood had a lot of influence. No matter who we called, we got the same answer. Is this the documentary Natalie wants stopped? Don't call me again. Actors Eli Wallach and Ann Jackson were appearing in a dramatic production in Los Angeles, and she agreed to see me. I went to the place they were staying and gave her the transcript of the first 30 minutes of the program. Five minutes later, she started screaming and sobbing, saying she could never be part of this program. Eli Wallach started yelling at me, saying, what did you do to my wife? We have a performance this afternoon. Get the hell out of here, which I did. Dan and I tried to figure out what was going on. We had looked at the first 30 minutes many times, and while it was filled with blunt comments that were never before heard on TV, it was moving, and in the end, very powerful. We finally realized that the problem was that the transcript was cold and stark and overwhelmingly severe and missed the humanity of the women speaking, as evident in the video itself. So we resolved that if any actress agreed to see us, we would show her the first 30 minutes of the program, not give her the transcript. And it worked. Lee Grant, who was coming off the blacklist, agreed to see us in her Malibu home, saying not, nothing Natalie Wood could say would scare her away from doing the program. We met her at her home, showed her the first 30 minutes, and in tears, she agreed to do the narration. I'll never know whether she would have agreed to do the show if she had only read the transcript, but we weren't about to take that kind of a chance again. Lee Grant was our last hope. But Lee Grant had one request. She too had known the Hollywood makeup artist who refused to get treatment because of fear of disfigurement, and she insisted that we do an epilogue asking doctors to come up with ways of restoring the body through re reconstructive surgery. You have to understand just what a radical mastectomy, the accepted way of treating breast cancer at the time, is all about. For the first time, we revealed on television that it was not a simple mastectomy where only the breast was removed, but a massive surgical procedure that not only removed the breast, but the underlying, underlying chest muscles and lymph nodes. The recovery period could take as long as a year. There were only a few doctors in the United States at that time who advocated a smaller procedure, and they were a minority. Most oncologists were against reconstructive surgery since many felt that it would obscure new cancers and create other problems. So when I told the UCLA doctors that I was planning to do an epilogue on reconstructive surgery, they were not happy about it. In fact, the American Cancer Society found out about the proposed epilogue 
and said it would campaign against the program if we even mentioned reconstructive surgery at all in the documentary. I wrote some copy and sent it to our UCLA physicians who still said we couldn't put that on the air. So I rewrote the copy several times until it was finally, albeit reluctantly, approved. Then I sent it to Lee Grant who said it was acceptable. It turned out that that epilogue was one of the most important parts of the program because it created a discussion about the subject as thousands of women insisted that it be part of their recovery treatment. Today, a plastic surgeon is often included in the initial operation to prepare the area for future reconstruction. And once insurance companies agreed to pay for the procedure, reconstructive surgery became commonplace. In addition, the program advocated a two-step procedure instead of the way it was usually done in the early 1970s. The woman would go under the knife, not knowing if she would wake up with just a small bandage meaning the biopsy was negative and she did not have cancer, or with massive bandages and great pain, meaning that she had the radical mastectomy. The argument then was that the patient was under anesthesia and that the cancer could be taken out immediately. But the program argued that the biopsy should be done in one procedure and then the woman could consider alternatives and prepare herself for the next procedure if she had cancer. Dr. Melvin Silverstein, who was a key participant in the documentary, and other doctors eventually pioneered smaller procedures in dealing with breast cancer that are now commonplace. But in 1973, the year we shot the documentary, the American Cancer Society made it clear that radical mastectomy was the only acceptable treatment for breast cancer and that reconstructive surgery was still in the experimental stage and not an acceptable procedure. One of the happiest parts of this documentary for me is that most of it is now obsolete. Many of the issues we discuss in this show have long been resolved. I always tell my students that I wish for all of them that they have an opportunity to do a program like Why Me, which is credited with saving thousands of lives. The 3M company bought and distributed the program and claimed in its publicity that one out of every three women in the Western world saw the documentary. A year later, PBS also broadcast the documentary and in every city the documentary aired, women started doing self-examinations and they flocked to their doctors to order mammographies. For years, everywhere I went, if someone found out I was responsible for Why Me, a breast cancer survivor or a relative would come up to me thanking me for saving her life or the lives of their mother or sister or girlfriend or other significant women in their lives. It turned out to be a privilege to have done a program that at first I was so reluctant to do. This is one of the few times that Why Me will be screened in its entirety on a large screen with an audience. The picture may be a bit faded, but the program is intact, and it will be interesting to see how an audience in 2010 responds to a program that was so controversial 36 years ago. Why Me is an old-fashioned documentary in which the word is as important as the picture. There are no fast cuts or short sound bites, and you really have to listen to the documentary to get its full value. In fact, CBS Radio ran the documentary in its entirety without any changes at all. The audio soundtrack tells the story with or without video. The first half contains little narration and lets the women tell their story without interruption. But the second half was constructed to save lives and not to be a creative piece of work. We believed that doctors, patients, and experts on breast cancer talking directly into the camera to women watching the show was the most effective way of informing them about this disease and its ramifications. I might also add that Lee Grant was extremely emotional when reading her narration on camera. Again, you must remember, these were different times when even talking about breast cancer was an emotional experience. So here is the one hour documentary minus commercials. I thank you for coming and I hope that Why Me is as meaningful tonight as it was four decades ago. Thank you very much.
Hello, I'm Lee Grant. Think of 15 women you know. Your mother, your sister, your friends, me, you, one of us. One out of 15 women will develop at some time in their lives breast cancer. In this next hour, we're going to talk about breast cancer. The subject is as hard for me to talk about as it is for you to watch and to listen to. But stay with me. In order to fight it, we have to face it. The material is explicit and recommended for a mature audience. You must have been a beautiful baby. You must have been a wonderful child. For some reason, Americans seem to have a breast fetish. And little girls are just taught that breasts are important. When you were only starting to go to kindergarten, I bet you drove the little boys wild. When I was growing up, I wanted to have big breasts because I, I thought of Sophia Loren and cleavage, and, and that meant that you were a real woman. And when it came to winning blue ribbon, you must have shown the other kids how. Of course, as a commodity on the market, having larger breasts uh, meant that you were more likely to sell better, you know, that uh, you got more attention. I can see the judge's eyes as they handed you the prize. I bet you made the cutest bow. Every time you turn on the television, you see breasts, or you walk down the street, you see breasts, you see your mother, you see breasts. You see breasts everywhere you go. Well, you must have been a beautiful baby, cause baby, look at you now. I think I would prefer to have an arm or a portion of a leg or something removed rather than the breast. And uh, I don't know whether it's a, it's certainly not just a sexual thing, but um, I, I don't know. It's involved with children and uh, breastfeeding and just so many things. To lose a breast is a deformity. And I don't know whether I could get away from that feeling, whether I would ever really feel comfortable uh, in uh, a casual relationship, you know, to, to be comfortable about my body. I'm afraid I would spend a lot of time, you know, hiding it and being ashamed of it. The loss of a breast is an unbearable thought. Maybe that's why so many of us just refuse to even think about breast cancer. We ignore it. We run away from it. That's the most dangerous thing we can do. Every day in this country, 170 women are told they have cancer of the breast. Every day in this country, 85 women die of breast cancer. 50% of all women who develop a cancer in the breast are dead within five years. The cure rates are no better today than they were 35 years ago, so we can't run away from it. The best thing that we can do is know all the facts about breast cancer, how to know if we have it, what to do if we get it, how to live with it for the rest of our lives. If you're a woman, what you're about to see could save your life. Once a month, just once a month, while you're taking a shower and you have a few moments, before you dry or spray or do any of those little things to pamper yourself, do something to take care of yourself. Examine your breasts. That's where it begins. It's a nothing example. So I had seen a commercial on TV that uh, women should periodically check their breasts, and I, hadn't, I didn't know how to go about it. And uh, one night I was lying in bed and I just happened to think I would, you know, just poke around, see if I could find anything. I first discovered the lump in my breast when I scratched my chest in the middle of the night. And I remember waking the next morning and telling my husband that I had a terrible nightmare, that I had dreamt I had a lump on my breast. And when I went to show him where the lump was, there was indeed a lump. I had often wondered, would I know a lump if I felt it? And uh, I knew. <laughs> I felt it. It was very hard. It was like a little marble. And uh, my heart skipped a beat, and I, I realized this must be something. I didn't find the same lump on the other side, and I was frightened, very frightened. I was um, about six months pregnant, and it just 
I was there one morning, and I told my husband, and I, um, I was scared. I went to the doctor, and he said he thought it was milk glands. My husband at that time seemed to want to think that there was nothing wrong with the lump. Uh, if I would bring it up, he would just ignore the whole subject. Occasionally, I would have twinges of, gee, what if it is, and it could be, but uh, he would put me down in such a way that I would just say, oh, you know, forget about it and it'll go away type reaction of, to myself. So we just ignored the whole thing for two years. I made an appointment with my doctor and I went in to see him and he didn't think that it was anything to worry about. And he told me that I should have my period and see if the lump didn't go away. So I waited. <laughs> and uh, then after the next period came, the lump hadn't gone away and I'd said a lot of prayers in the meantime, but it still hadn't gone away. So I went in to see him. I finally took myself uh, to a surgeon. And I did this very quietly. I didn't tell my husband or anybody. I just wanted to have this reconfirmed. And um, the surgeon said that he was very suspicious uh, of the lump, and he really didn't feel it should be there. And he'd much rather see it under a microscope than in me. So I came home and thought about it for a while. And um, either you're faced with the, the fear of cancer and the fear of losing part of yourself. And uh, it's, a, it's a, terrible, a terrible ordeal to face. Once they've had an examination and the doctor leads them to believe that this lump may be malignant and that they stand the chance of losing the breast and possibly their lives, there is a kind of impotent rage that takes over. Damn it, why me? It's a totally helpless position. It's an angering position. And um, so that at that point, one of the things that women report is uh, just a kind of blind, diffuse fury. They strike out at just about everybody in total helplessness. You feel frightened that it is cancer, that it is, you think that it is cancer, and then knowing that if it is, that you are going to lose your breast. And I, um, I think you just went in and run and I was in shock for, I know, a day or two. I just couldn't believe it and I sat down and I didn't, I didn't tell anyone. I was just trying to think of who I could talk to and they really didn't know anyone to talk to. I didn't think that it was real. I thought it was something that could happen to somebody else, but that it wasn't real. It was a real nightmare, something that I had dreamt that it wasn't really happening. I think the most frightening Part of the whole thing to me was the fear of dying. I wasn't ready for dying. I don't know if anyone ever is, but I had two babies and a nice husband, and I felt like I had a lot of life left. He asked me to sign a paper which said I would approve of him performing a mastectomy, and this scared me, so I went home and I said to my husband, you know, it frightened me to have to sign that paper when both doctors are assuring me that the lump is benign. So uh, when you go in for the surgery, you are not really sure whether you are just going to have the, the tumor taken out or whether you are going to have the complete surgery. He explained to me that they, they put the, the woman to sleep, they do a biopsy, they send it to pathology, and then depending on what they find, I mean, if it's, if it's benign, then, there's, then I'd be out in two days, but if it turned out to be anything serious, then of course, I, he, said, we'll have, we, he said, well, we'll just have to take off your breasts, or, and I almost fell off the table. I'd never heard of such a thing. I mean, I'd never heard of just saying, well, come in and do that. I just thought the man's crazy. I, I, couldn't, I couldn't even deal with that information. Most women are frightened of the term radical mastectomy, and of course a doctor should uh, explain to the patient what he means by radical mastectomy. Actually, it's the loss of the breast, it's the loss of the muscles and the front part of the armpit, and it's the loss of the glands under the arm. If that is necessary to cure the patient, uh, the patient should accept it. I trusted my doctors implicitly, two different doctors who told me that they had examined thousands and thousands of breasts assured me because of the way the lump felt, because of the way the lump looked, because of 
the fact that there was no history of cancer in my family and because I was 33 years old that they felt that it was going to be benign and I remember my surgeon assuring me that the scar would be so little I could be a topless waitress the week after the operation. We just went into it sort of blindly. I didn't know what was going to happen. I had no idea. Um, I didn't know what I was going to look like. I just put myself in the hands of the doctor and I, you know, I wanted to live and I felt he was going to make me live. Hello, Isabel. How are you good tonight? Fine. Good. Thank That's you. a fancy outfit you've got on tonight. I needed something uh, to cheer myself up. Good. good, all right. Are you all set for tomorrow? Yes. Good, it's 9 o'clock. Yes. I've taken your mammograms to UCLA and Dr. Gold has reviewed them with me and he agrees too that that little area that right breast should come out, yeah. He doesn't really think it's malignant, and I hope it isn't, trust it isn't. And one thing you may be sure, you're not gonna lose a breast unless her, everybody's absolutely sure, two or three with doctors and uh, pathologists too, of course, uh, that there is enough indication there for. Now, is your family going to be here in the morning? Yes, my parents right. will well, be I'll, I'll meet them up on 7th floor uh, right afterwards. If there's any question about it being a malignancy, I'll come down and talk to them before we do any operating. Oh, fine. Okay? Very good. One thing you're sure I've already told you, that you're not going to lose your breast unless it's absolutely necessary. Yes. Good. All right, dear, I'll Very see good. you in the morning. Yes. Okay, fine. Thank you, Dr. Sperling. Good night. He then told me in a very abrupt but down-to-earth, matter-of-fact way that if by chance the lump turned out to be malignant, I would wake up in intensive care. If I woke up in my own room, it hadn't been malignant. They wheeled me into the operating room and uh, I was drowsy, but I remember being aware of the nurses in their uniforms, their green uniforms, and they were talking among themselves and they were pointing out over here was a, a package of bandages uh, that was to be used in case the surgery was radical, more extensive. And it flashed through my mind that, oh boy, that's, that's a possibility. And then uh, the anesthesia took effect and I don't remember much after that. We're not quite ready, Dr. Nodell will be in just a few minutes, and uh, I'll see you right afterwards. Okay? Fine. Bye. I have faith in my doctor. I have faith. The whole operation total will take about a half an hour, and I'll be home Saturday night. I'm just anxious to get it over with and go home. Hopefully, it'll be a three-day stay. And if it's not, then it's not. But whatever has to be done, I know the doctor will do. This girl's only 38 years old, has had this little mass in her right breast. Two separate radiologists have both recommended that it come out. And no breast cancer in her, in her family? No, no, there's no family history. It's pretty good shape. I hope it isn't a radical. I do to deserve this. It seems unreal. There is no cancer in my family. It came as a shock out of the blue. Like, wow, not me. I dreamed that um, something had happened in the operating room. People were very sad. My parents were sad, and they were very sad for me. Maybe it was a portent of something to come. If they do find something, they will go ahead and remove my breast. I wouldn't like it. I hope to wake up in one piece. I don't fear the uh, uh, incision. I actually fear not waking up. I want to wake up. I'm enjoying my life. When I went in for the surgery, I expected to be out in three quarters of an hour because I was so convinced that the whole thing would be benign. But when I was, when I woke up from the anesthetic and I saw that it was six and a half or six and three quarter hours later, I knew that it, that I had lost a breast and I, I didn't know how much else I had lost, but I knew that that was it. The first thought after the operation was why do I have all these heavy bandages on my chest when I had been told there would just be one band-aid. And also I remember being in pain and I had been told that there would be no pain and I felt 
like my chest was a, a highway for two tron trucks going back and forth. And I remember asking the nurses in the recovery room how my breast was, and they assured me everything was fine. So I lay back thinking, well, it just hurt more than I thought it would. I woke up from the surgery while still on the operating table. And I remember hearing the doctor's voice above me, standing above me and saying, put a bandage across here. And I remember that it was a very large bandage and I was conscious enough to know that it was covering my whole chest area, not just a little band-aid that might have been covering where a lump was removed. And I said to him, you had to do the radical, didn't you? And he said to me, yes, we did. But I returned to the hospital room and noticed that my sister had been crying and couldn't look at me. And my husband kept hugging my hand tightly. And when I made a comment, am I still going to be a topless waitress, the laughter was very nervous, so I knew something was wrong. I could tell by the bandages that it was gone. I had more or less expected that it would be. And my, I remember exactly my first question was, did they take it? And uh, they said, yes. And I said, is it all right? Did they get it all? That's your first thoughts. And they said, yes. I started thinking about how I had three young children and I myself was very young and uh, I, I might not live to see my oldest child graduate from elementary school and I got to feeling pretty sorry for myself and I cried a lot. I wanted to um, close my eyes and go to sleep and wake up and find out that it had been an, a nightmare, that it wasn't really true. And I remember looking at my husband and my sister and they looked in such pain that I didn't want to let out my pain, so I remember just closing my eyes. Okay, fine. Now, here it is, here you're right there. Are you ready to start? Uh, yeah. okay. I think that should be big enough, don't you, Jerry? Mm -hmm. Just a small rake. We'll be ready. I think it was two or three days after my surgery and the bandages were off, why the nurses and the doctor came in and stood me up in front of the mirror and said, now take a look. You must look at this because this is the way it is and it won't, uh, it will get a little better, but it's always going to be like this and you must face it and know and then you go and build from there. And when you, when you are stripped and you look at yourself, it's, uh, you're horrified. You really, you just say you cry. I'd been through the mastectomy and been home probably about two weeks when I first saw the scar and, and my ribs without the bandage. I'd gone to the doctor that afternoon and everything had cleared up, so he'd taken them away. And that evening, I took my first bath, and that probably was the most difficult time I had. Uh, in the bathtub, I looked at myself, and when I got out with all these reflections in the mirror, there I, I was, and I really had to just look at myself, and it was, it was devastating. I was very upset, and I think that that was the lowest point that I had. I was afraid to look, and I finally went down and took a bath and made myself look, and I just sat there and bawled. I cried and cried and cried. I was so, so upset. I don't, I don't know that it was that horrible, but it was a shock to finally see what, what had happened to me. And then the easiest way was not to look at the scar. So I'd zip in the bathroom, which is mirror lined, and take a bath and zip out. <laughs> and I really avoided mirrors for a long, long time when I didn't have any clothes on. And uh, maybe I still avoid them. I think that looking at themselves is a, an honest confrontation with the loss that if they don't look at it, they can maintain some denial system. They can, they can keep up some kind of pretense uh, as though something magical and mystical may have happened. And I think, too, that there's another aspect to it, and that is 
that there is so much emphasis on beauty, on, on being whole and round and perfect and symmetrical, that uh, the idea of a red and jagged and raw scar on a chest is something that is intolerable. I just had to cry. I was alone in the house, and I just had to cry. I cried myself to sleep. And I can remember thinking, I think the definite question that we all ask ourselves, why me? Uh, I can remember that going through my mind, but I can also remember a stronger th saying that was there, was that, okay, you can cry tonight and get it out of your system, but tomorrow you're not going to cry anymore. I think this is a job. Yeah, it feels a little rough. I feels all that terrible. I'm not going to get in there. That's fine. Between these two, we have it, don't Pretty you? Pretty small, son. All right. Yeah. Well, you see there? It may be a little cyst there. Sir, you see this right mm -hmm. there? That may be a little cyst. I'm going to go beyond it, yeah. It's always good. Yeah. Well, that's a good sign, isn't it? Part of what presents a problem in our society is that women, perhaps all of us, but women and the men who respond to them very often respond to parts, parts of the body, rather than the whole woman. And so when she is deformed and she has lost the part he loves, she's scared that she will lose him. My husband had placed emphasis on the breast previous to my operation because he enjoyed wearing my wearing clothes that were braless and bikinis and low-cut dresses. So I was very concerned how he would react to my operation. I, I said to myself, my husband's never going to see me this way. I just won't allow it. And, uh, and then I, I, I talked it over with my husband and uh, he was very wonderful. He, he just reassured me that this was not important and it wasn't going to be important in our relationship at all. It was going, wasn't going to affect our sex life. It wasn't going to uh, make him feel any differently toward me. That uh, I was still the same person and that I was alive and well and that's all that mattered. I can honestly say there was basically no reaction from my husband. We were separated at the time. He never called the hospital. He never came to see me. So there was just no reaction to it. In later months, I found that he couldn't face up to it. I really think it depends on, on the quality of the marriage. I'm sure that with some marriages, it could destroy a marriage. And uh, my first husband, I don't know, maybe it was just that point in time. I doubt that he and I could have survived a mastectomy, but our marriage didn't survive anyway. If a gentleman asked me to go out with him, I certainly didn't feel badly about it because I felt that he was asking me to go out. He wasn't dating my left breast, so to speak. And I didn't have any qualms about telling a date that this is the way I was because uh, I didn't think that there was anything wrong in it. My husband was extremely important to me through this period and uh, very sensitive and loving and I I just can't imagine if he hadn't been what would have happened. I, I needed this so much. I found varied reactions from the men. Some would just show a, a, a moment of almost fear and I could just picture them getting up and running away from the dinner table we were seated at. And other men took it very nicely and uh, other men, it just, they all reacted differently. Some men were definitely afraid of it and others weren't. But I didn't feel uh, that it was, it was the same. I thought he was much more impersonal. I have a beautiful sexual life. Uh, I have a brand new husband and certainly everyone knows that in the first years of marriage uh, this plays a very important part of a marriage and uh, if there had been any problem I don't think that uh, we would be as happy as we are. It's Sex is beautiful with one or two breasts. It doesn't matter. Fix that around here and shoot there. I want to work in that area next. Can you get it? Mm -hmm. All right, thank you. 
over Thank you. I want to be sure. I think this represents the mass, you see, that we were feeling. Mm -hmm. a little cystic. I think we just have to come around this area here now. If you want to retract over there, please. Maybe not. Okay. Uh, one of the decisions I came to uh, after the surgery was not to tell my children about it. They were very young, and I just felt it would be very difficult for them to understand. And so uh, for five years, I didn't tell them that I had had cancer, and there was a chance that I might have a recurrence. They just didn't know. And I was very careful to, uh, when I got up in the morning, put on a a brassiere with a form in it, even, even if I put my nightgown back over it, so that uh, they wouldn't be aware that there was anything different. When I first came home and undressed in front of my one daughter, when she saw the, sc the scar, she just stood there and stared, which put me into a total tailspin as far as... Uh, I started to cry and carry on because I thought, my God, you know, here she is looking at some kind of a freak. Well, Jeannie at one point had said that, asked if she was just going to have one breast like mommy, and we sort of laughed and said no, that she, you know, she would have two breasts, and then we sort of explained what had happened. Some of my friends had said, oh, poor girl, she's really going to be miserable. She's going to take it very hard because she's so vain and self-conscious. Uh, I made up my mind at that point, I think, that uh, I wasn't going to let this be a factor. It had happened. There was nothing I could do to make it unhappen. And I was going to live with it just like I had lived before. You have to have exercises for your arms and your sides after you have the surgery because your muscles have to be rebuilt. And they tighten up. So you have a series of exercises that are very important for you to do. I worked very hard to regain the uh, use of the muscles that controlled my arm and uh, and just generally put myself in very healthy shape. I think this made me feel that I was going to stay alive and, and be well. Yeah, now I think we've got it all, actually. Can we have that back again? All right, here we are. Let's see what this feels like. Gary, I've got that nodule out. You feel it right in there several in there and uh, oh, yeah, right there. yeah yeah and it bulges out you see and so far there's no evidence of malignancy you can call the pathologist now when I went to buy the prosthesis the form that is inserted in the bra I was very nervous and the saleswoman wasn't there who specialized in selling these and the woman who was there was very curt and abrupt and I remember feeling very sensitive and hurt that she wasn't more understanding because it was very important to me buying this for the first time that I was dealt with with a little more compassion. And as soon as you get your fittings and you can put your sweaters on again and then you look like yourself then that's when your spirits pick up again and you feel like uh, you're back to normal. I remember being a little uncomfortable when I first met the gaze of, of people on the outside. Uh, I, I thought they were maybe looking to see which side had been removed and, and to see if I looked any, any different. I worry about how I look in clothes and sometimes I'll get dressed and then I'll bend over or I'll look in the mirror and I'll decide I won't wear that dress. Most of the clothes that I can't wear I've gotten rid of but there are a few that I like very much, I haven't gotten rid of. I had my operation two years ago, two and a half years ago. And some of the dresses I try on and then I put back in the closet. Maybe I should get rid of them or maybe I should just go ahead and wear them. I don't know, but I haven't yet. Before the operation, I live on the beach, so I live really mostly in bikinis. And I wore braless dresses because my husband preferred them and I grew to be very comfortable in them. So that after the operation, it was really an adjustment for me to realize that I could no longer wear a bikini and the braless dresses. And it was difficult for me because there were times when I felt very sorry for myself when I'd see a beautiful girl go by in a bikini and I'd realize I never can wear a bikini again. To go shopping is 
is quite an emotional adjustment. You see pretty things that are decollete and uh, sleeveless or strapless that uh, you see advertised and around and girls look pretty in them and feminine and sexy and um, you can't wear those clothes anymore. I think having had cancer and it being such an unknown disease, there's no known cause and cure, that it was very frightening to me because I felt, particularly after my second and third and eighth operation, that uh, perhaps I would get it again and not recover. So I think I was very frightened for a long period of time till I just came to terms with myself and realized that I couldn't live in fear, that I was going to live in the moment, and that that's all there was, and that worrying about it would only be destructive. <laughs> this is a 38-year-old girl, mass uh, right breast. Uh, would you mind looking at it? Not at all. The absolute most important thing that any woman can do, if she feels a lump in her breast, she's got to go in, she's got to get a, a doctor's opinion. That doctor may tell her it's nothing, or he may tell her that that lump has got to be removed. The delay can only harm the patient. She's going to worry about that lump, she's not going to know what it is. The vast majority of lumps that we see are benign. And therefore, most patients who come in and show us a lump Fine. are going to get good news. Fine. Thank you very much, Dr. McClure. Yeah. What is that? It looks like it's benign. There's really nothing <coughs> very suspicious there. Huh? Open your eyes, honey. Isabel, can you open your eyes? Huh? It should be awake pretty fast. Your operation's finished. Mm -hmm. Isabel, your operation's finished. I, I couldn't believe the operation was over. And I was just very groggy, and you hear all kinds of voices around you. The doctor was saying, you're fine, darling, you're fine. You have nothing to worry about. And I said, well, when do we go into surgery? He said, you already have. Isabel, how do you feel? Huh? Okay? Yeah. It's all finished, you know. Easy it was easy, huh? Okay. Well, it's over. Thank God. My, my greatest fear was the fact that I stopped breathing, that I w wouldn't wake up. And I did. And uh, I'm still waking up more. Okay, fine. Okay, dear. Are you awake? Wide awake. And I tell you, you wouldn't sleep very long? Everything went, everything went beautifully. Yeah. Dr. Neville did a nice, very nice, beautiful job of anesthesia. So you're wide awake now. And the best news of all is that this thing is benign. We examined it very, very carefully. There's no evidence of malignancy at all. You should be able to go home tomorrow morning. Okay? Okay, yeah. I'll see you later. Bye-bye. After the fuzz cleared, I got happier and happier because the realization of what had happened I thank God that I didn't have the radical mastectomy, and I feel great relief that I won't have to go through that again. Four out of five operations end up with a biopsied lump that is proven to be benign, non-malignant, no cancer. And if the lump turns out to be malignant, your best chance of surviving is through early diagnosis and treatment. The way to cut down the odds is to examine yourself monthly. 95% of all lumps in the breast are discovered by the women themselves. I am my doctor's best diagnostic tool because I'm the one that lives inside of my body every day and I'm really the one, if I'm aware of all these signs and symptoms and signals, that knows when my body is changing. So unless you're examining your breast monthly, you're really not giving yourself a fair chance to, to help your doctor with an early diagnosis. And there's some very specific things that, that you should look for when you're examining your breasts. Have they changed? Any kind of discoloration, any kind of a dimpling or any kind of a puckering, any kind of fluid coming from your nipples. The only way that you're going to know what's normal for your breasts and how they look is by examining them once a month after your menstrual period. 
The next part of the examination is the palpation and the feeling of your breast. The way you do that is to, if you're going to examine your left breast first, you put your left arm over your head. And then take your right hand, you want to use the ball tips of your fingers and just very, very gently think of your breast as a clock with 12 o'clock up here and 6 o'clock down here. But what you need to do is to take the ball tips of your finger and just very, very gently say 12 o'clock and 1 o'clock and 2 o'clock. Now what we're going to do after we finish the outer circle of our breast is then to go in on the inner circle of your breast. Now when you get down to the 6 o'clock position on the outer side of your breast, you're going to feel a ridge there. Now that's okay. Don't worry when you feel that. That's, that's partly breast bone and cartilage and that's something that does belong there. The only way you're going to know what's normal for your breast is if you do this once a month. Now notice how gently don't press hard. I know that you have the feeling that you really need to press hard to feel something, but you don't need to. Just be gentle. Okay, now we're back to 12 o'clock. Okay, now you've done the outer circle of the clock. Now we want to do the inner circle of the clock. Now depending on how large your breast is, now see I can get four numbers here, so I want to go 12 o'clock and then 3 o'clock. All the time keeping in mind you're not looking for cancer. What you're doing is just maintaining your health, making sure there's nothing new. Okay, now when you finish the inner circle, then you want to do the nipple. And just very, very, very gently. Now you see where you really have covered your entire breast. Now while your arm is up, reach under your arm here and check and see if there's any swelling there. Just make sure that everything is the same as it was last month. Okay, now what we want to do now is raise your other arm and repeat the exact same procedure. After you've you finished examining yourself at the mirror, the next thing to do is to examine yourself lying down. When you lie down, your breast is flat against your chest because you'll be able to see that you really can feel slightly different things than you do when you're standing up. Self-examination is important. Now there are ways to find the cancer even before your own eyes and hands discover it. The earlier the cancer is discovered, the greater the chances of survival. If you discover something suspicious, if you have a family history of cancer, or if you're over 35, you should see your doctor. Your doctor now has tools of detection that are swift, simple, painless. Cancer cells produce more heat than normal cells do. Thermography records the patterns of heat coming from the surface of the breasts. So hot spots found on the heat photograph alert the physician that something may be wrong. Thermography is not a very specific type of examination, and doctors admit that most positive thermograms do not mean cancer. It is simply something that should be carefully checked out. The doctor then investigates the possibility of cancer through a clinical physical examination. Usually he finds nothing to worry about. Healthy breasts may be normally lumpy. A suspicious lump may turn out to be a benign cyst that's a harmless collection of fluid. Or it may be a condition called fibroadenoma that's a solid, smooth, benign tumor. After the physical examination, the patient is given a mammogram. This special x-ray technique is designed for examining the breast, and it is the best detection tool your doctor has. The breast is x-rayed from two angles, up and down and side to side. It is painless and quick. The two views are put together to get a three-dimensional picture of the breast. Mammography offers women great hope. Cancers only a few millimeters in size that can't be felt are often pinpointed for removal. This increases a woman's chance for survival by almost 40%. These are the mammograms of the patient whom we have just examined. And what we see here really matches what we felt during the physical examination. And nothing here looks suspicious to me of any malignant change. So I would say this is probably a young girl with mammary dysplasia or fibrocystic disease. Nothing suggestive of cancer. On the other hand, here's a patient whom we saw recently, and there's a small mass which wasn't even palpated, and yet the indistinctness of the margin of the mass suggests that it is a malignancy, and this did turn out to be cancer. Here is a rather large mass in another patient, 
again, whom we have recently seen, with a very, very indistinct outline. And this certainly looks like cancer, and this is one they're going to have to take out. I think mammography is probably the best available screening technique right now. It's possible with mammography to pick up an occult lesion. And by that I mean a lesion that is too small to be felt either by the patient or the physician. Now these lesions are by far the most curable. You know, and if any lesion is going to be cured by small surgery, uh, small non-deforming surgery, it's going to be the occult lesion picked up by mammography. Personally, I would like to see every woman in America get this yearly. Uh, I'm not certain that, that this can be arranged due to the financial problems, but uh, certainly the higher risk patients, patients uh, who have a family history of breast cancer or patients who have had breast cancer on one side should, should absolutely have mammography once a year. Doctors do agree on one point. It's impossible to tell with 100% accuracy if a lump is or is not cancer without examining it under the microscope. For the woman with a malignant lump in her breast, it all comes down to one final question. What should she do? Her options are limited. There is radiation therapy. Here the cancer is destroyed by bombarding it with x-rays or atomic particles. There is chemotherapy. Here the cancer is destroyed with drugs or chemicals. There is immunotherapy. Here, the body's own immunological system is used to fight the cancer. All three, radiation, chemotherapy, and immunotherapy, are not recommended for the initial treatment of breast cancer and are usually used to relieve or slow the advance of widespread disease. Right now, the only acceptable treatment for breast cancer is some kind of surgery. The real question is, how much surgery? A lumpectomy or tylectomy? The surgeon removes the local tumor with a small amount of the surrounding tissue. This is a very limited surgical procedure, seldom if ever recommended. A wedge resection or partial mastectomy. The surgeon removes a segment of the breast that includes the local tumor. At times, as much as half the breast is removed. It's still considered investigational. A simple or total mastectomy. The surgeon removes the entire breast. Everything else is left intact still considered investigational. An extended simple or total mastectomy. The surgeon removes the entire breast as well as some of the lymph nodes in the armpit, occasionally recommended on an individual basis. A modified radical mastectomy. The surgeon removes the entire breast and most of the lymph nodes in the armpit. The underlying chest muscles may be removed in part, but are usually left in place after the nodes are removed more surgeons are beginning to recommend this procedure. The classical Holstead radical mastectomy developed more than 80 years ago by Professor William S. Halsted, for decades considered the only legitimate surgical treatment for breast cancer. The surgeon removes the entire breast, the underlying muscles, and all the lymph nodes in the armpit. A skin graft may be required to close the deep chest wound. An extended radical mastectomy or supra-radical mastectomy. The surgeon removes the entire breast, the underlying chest muscles, all the lymph nodes in the armpit, and the internal mammary chain of lymph nodes in the chest and neck regions. More and more surgeons are recommending a lesser procedure because this one can be devastating to the patient and less extensive surgery can be as effective. The reason so many doctors take so much out is that cancer of the breast spreads first to the local lymph nodes, which send the cancer cells out to the rest of the body. The idea is to cut away all the tissues invaded by microscopic cancer cells so the disease will not spread to the rest of the body. The problem is that no one knows when or how or if the cancer has spread to the lymph nodes until those nodes are removed and examined under the microscope. So to make sure the cancer is stopped completely, most doctors want to clean out the entire area the complete breast, the underlying chest muscles, and the crucial lymph nodes. The current state of the art right now is that if a patient comes in and she has what appears to be curable breast cancer, it should be treated surgically. Now the real controversy comes not in whether through surgery or some other form of therapy, but what kind of surgery. Do you do radical mastectomy? Do you do partial resection of it? This is the controversy, and it's far from solved. Since there are no comparative studies, 
to indicate that radical operations for breast cancer produce any better results than the simpler procedures, it is now the responsibility of those who persist in performing the radical mastectomy to submit acceptable evidence to justify the continuation of this mutilating procedure. In spite of 12 years of trial, it is still much too early to recommend local breast surgery instead of radical. As far as I am concerned, any surgeon worth his salt will recommend a radical mastectomy. I do stand firmly against the traditional radical mastectomy. I consider it to be archaic, and I believe it has no place in the modern treatment of breast cancer. Removal of the entire breast, most often the radical or modified radical mastectomy, is recommended for surgical treatment of operable breast cancer. Limited surgical procedures which remove less than the entire breast have not been scientifically proven to be as effective as mastectomy. Recommendations should be made by the physician on an individual basis. We don't presently have sufficient scientific information to know what is best to do. Our current means of cancer control are very crude and very physical in essence, they amount to, if your right hand offends you, cut it off. Surgery probably is a, a primitive way to treat breast cancer. In fact, it's probably a primitive way to treat all forms of cancer, really. But we don't have any better way. An ideal way would be when we are immunologically sophisticated to in some way make some immune type of drug that can go directly to the cancer and kill it but we're far from anything like that. And so, by f right now, the best way for treating virtually all curable types of cancer is with surgery. One of the dilemmas that the patient faces is deciding whether or not to go along with a physician's recommendation that the breast be removed. That frequently is, is just too much for her to fathom, and she finds herself bargaining with the surgeon. Maybe you don't have to take the whole breast off. Maybe you can just take part. Maybe you can just remove the, the lump or just take out a section. Because at that point, suddenly, if you can compromise, if you can maintain your life and your physical appearance, that, of course, is the route you want to go. At this point, the surgeon may say, I don't believe in that. If I'm going to do the procedure, I do a radical or nothing at all. If you want a partial removal, you're going to have to see somebody else. Uh, for some people, when the surgeon puts it in those terms, you shift your priorities. I think it's important to emphasize what we're trying to do is stave off death from cancer. And not only just death from cancer, but in many cases a long and prolonged painful death. This is what cancer of the breast can do to a patient and what radical mastectomy may prevent. I think if you go less and then a modified radical, for example, simple or, or partial mastectomy, I think that is definitely experimental, and I think a woman is taking a risk. Exactly how big the risk is, I don't know. I think that she should be informed of this risk, and I think if she wants to take that risk, I think that's her decision once she knows all that she can possibly know about the disease. One of the problems that women face in a situation of this kind is that unfortunate one of the cure being worse than the disease. And so that while from the surgeon's point of view, if he has saved a life and can maintain that life, he feels that he's done a successful job, the patient may well ask, is this what you call living? And would I perhaps have been better off the other way? I think my, my real emotional interest in breast cancer began about five years ago. I think prior to that time, I did radical mastectomies on every patient that I saw with operable breast cancer. And I looked at the wounds, and I was, I was proud of them. I thought that they were essentially a surgical work of art. I liked them. Uh, they were not displeasing to me. And then I had the occasion to, uh, to be making rounds one day and show one of these patients to a female psychiatrist who was uh, accompanying me. And I looked at the wound, and I said, it's beautiful. And I, I honestly meant this because it was beautiful to me. And the patient looked at me and then looked at the psychiatrist and said, it's ugly, isn't it? And before I could say anything, the psychiatrist said, yes, it is. And the patient started to cry. They had a long talk. I was very upset by the situation. Uh, I had a long talk myself with that psychiatrist, and she kind of set me straight and kind of got me thinking about the emotional aspects of the patient, about feeling, about understanding that the patients were simply uh, not 
people that you could just remove remove the breast and not understand what you've done emotionally and psychologically to them. I think that part of what might be helpful to women is if there were a space of time between the biopsy and the projected removal of the breast. It is as though signing for the one in advance of the other becomes something almost too monstrous for her to comprehend. And that when she goes in for the biopsy, with the hope that they will find something that doesn't require anything more than tiny removal and, clo and closing up, and then waking up to find this, this gigantic hole in her chest, can be a terribly traumatic experience. And so it might be useful to have time in between so that it can be explained to her. I think most surgeons would like to, like me, like to go ahead and do the definitive operation at one sitting. Remember, it's only one anesthesia instead of two. Uh, I think it's more a, a more efficient way, but I think it's not always in the best emotional interest of the patient, and I think this has got to be considered, you know, with the current uh, attitudes. And I think that we have got to, in certain patients, uh, do this as a two-stage procedure. It's our business to make the various considerations clear to her but in the end it's her decision it's her breast it's her body and she has a right to determine whether or not she wants to give up her breast most patients however do decide that life is more important uh, life free of cancer is more important and therefore will select the radical mastectomy I'm not really certain that the patient always has, has free choice. She may think she's chosen what she wants, but most of the time I think we end up convincing her what we think is, is right. I came to the doctors with a lump in my breast. They had a procedure, which is a barbaric procedure that is 100 years old. They told me this was the only procedure that, they would, that I could have that would save my life. They, they performed their procedure. Then they promptly lost interest. I was sent home, and I, I now look in the mirror, and I, and I say to myself, how can I go on with my life? I, was, I feel that I was very fortunate. I ignored my lump, and I got away with it. That's not always the case. So the first time you feel a lump, go, get it checked. If the doctor says they're going to do surgery, get it done because only if you do that and do the things that you should do you have a chance. It's the best chance you've got. I, I think I would say to a woman who is about to have a mastectomy uh, that it's something that has to be done. You don't have any choice. And uh, no matter how it turns out, you, you have to make the, the best of it. And you have to have a very optimistic feeling that you're going to live and that you're going to be well and that's the thing that will pull you through you, you just have to hope the most important thing a woman should know about breast cancer is that it's curable in a large percentage of cases it's curable and uh, the operations may def be deforming but the disease is curable and and one has got to decide whether living without a breast is, is a worthwhile way to live. I think most people will agree that it is. I think it's like someone you care for that dies, you miss them, and you sorrow for them, which is a healthy thing. But then life goes on and you live in the moment because that's all there is. If you're going to be negative or dwell on the part that makes you unhappy, you'll be unhappy. But if you dwell on the positive or live in the moment, then it becomes unimportant and you're just glad you're alive. I'd like a final word with you. Recently, a friend of mine died of breast cancer because she couldn't face a future with a mutilated body. She didn't know about the possibilities of cosmetic surgery. 
surgery sometimes ignored by physicians, mostly concerned with saving a woman's life, her physical life. If you are, like my friend, afraid, see your doctor. Talk over the possibilities of cosmetic surgery. Today, with this kind of surgery, there are difficulties. But if enough women talk to their doctors, perhaps the doctors and the plastic surgeons will come together to develop a less expensive, less painful way to repair a woman's body. If we have the means to repair bodies maimed in war, I feel that the future, with advances in cosmetic surgery for those who want it, for those who need it, can be very hopeful. Thank you. I'm Lee Grant. Good night. out but we still have some uh, how do we want to sit you want to sit oh, there I sit in the middle oh, okay All right. would you rather be oh no i'm fine no you sit in the middle it's fine uh, <sighs> <laughs> i'm judy muller i am an associate professor of journalism here at annenberg um and joe what's that <laughs> asked me if i would uh what is that? Moderate a, a very brief uh, talk um, f after this screening, and then we're going to open it to the audience for some questions as well, um, about a half an hour of our time. Um, and I, first of all, Joe, let's give him a hand. I mean, uh, just, uh, And just thanks for breaking down all those barriers that kept so many women in the dark oh, for so long. Yeah. Um, and it was a darkness that threatened, you know, many, many, many lives. Um, and I want to welcome um, Sandra um, Buffington. She is the director of the Hollywood Health and Society. It's a program of the USC Annenberg Norman Lear Center. And uh, she acts as a consultant to entertainment shows that deal with health issues, ER, Grey's Anatomy, well, you've seen them. And so she's right on the front lines of making sure that entertainment uh, is dealing with health issues in a way that certainly never happened in 1973. Uh, and we're going to talk a little bit about that in a minute as well. Um, and just a personal note, um, my daughter was, um, I'm going to try to get through this. Diagnosed with breast cancer when she was 30. And I have to say, Joe, it was a self exam. She found the lump. She had a mastectomy. She had chemotherapy, aggressive chemotherapy, but she had reconstructive surgery. And it wasn't until I watched this that I thought, my gosh, she's a living legacy, a living legacy of what this film did. So um, it's very emotional for me, and I'm going to get past this, but I wanted to say that out loud that, you know, we're one family that owes a huge debt of gratitude to this. Because for her generation, a self-exam is just a routine thing she does, you know, as part of her everyday life. So she's five years healthy, and, uh, you know, an amazing thing. Um, and just one more thing, Gina Thompson, is the woman who became symbolic of the program we've just seen. She is that beautiful blonde you saw walking on the beach and on this program. 
on the posters for this uh, movie, the, uh, the one who talked throughout. Um, we're happy to tell you that she is alive and well and living in Northern California, and she wanted to be here tonight, but her previous engagement made that impossible. But she asked us to read this statement. I was a part of this pioneering documentary on breast cancer because I trusted and respected the producer, Joe Saltzman. His knowledge, intelligence, and compassion on the subject made me acutely aware that along with his creativity, curiosity, inquisitiveness, and keen sense of humor, he would educate women all over the world about breast cancer. Joe heals through his artistry with his honesty, directness, caring, and authenticity. It was a privilege and honor to work with him on this film and to live long enough to thank him again for the educational influence on women and breast cancer 36 years later. Thank you, Joe, for your courage and insight in saving many women's lives, but also to support them emotionally through this challenging time. So that's from Gina. Um, Joe, you changed a lot of lives with this movie. Uh, and you saved a lot of lives with this film. Um, and it's what, to me, what journalism does best, what at its best, uh, makes such a huge difference in the world uh, for good. It changed lives. How did it change your life? Well, it had a tremendous effect on my life because I got out of television after that. It was just too grueling a documentary to do. <laughs> Uh, interviewing 150 women, sitting through seven mastectomies, going through that Natalie Wood hassle. And there was a, a, a horrible incident that happened to me in the operating room uh, on the operation you saw that convinced me that I should get out of the business because I would look in the mirror and I just didn't like the person I saw there. And the incident, which I, Judy has insisted I tell you about, which I really don't want to, but you can't argue with Judy. I mean, whatever Judy tells you to do, you do. But uh, what happened was during the surgery, we had been looking for a radical mastectomy. My whole concept for this show was in the midway part, we'd show a radical mastectomy, the operation would be done, and that would be how it would go. And we couldn't get one for a whole bunch of reasons, and I was running out of time, I was running out of money, running out of everything. When the doctor called me and he said, we have a patient, 99% sure it's a radical mastectomy. I, I said, are you sure? Because I'm not gonna go out there and, and it has to be a radical. Does she have cancer? Absolutely, Joe. Come on out. I talked to her. She'll talk to you. So I ran out there, convinced her to go on, brought the camera crew down, and for 24 hours we stayed there and we shot, as you saw, the entire operation. But what happened was when the pathologist said it's benign, I went berserk. I completely lost it. You have to understand that I was very obsessive about these documentaries. I don't think you, I could have done any of these shows, especially this one, unless I was obsessive about only the show. It destroyed our family life, our friends. I never saw anybody. I was just working on the show. And when this turned out not to be the radical mastectomy I had been assured, I started screaming at the doctor in the operating room. How, how come you didn't know this? We've shot this whole thing and now you're telling me it's not a radical mastectomy. Everybody in the room is, of course, staring at this lunatic, the nurses, the doctor. I mean, here this woman doesn't have cancer and I'm screaming at the doctor over this horrible uh, uh, situation that he had told me we were gonna have the operation, we didn't. We shot the rest of it. I then just ran out of the hospital, not even talking to anybody. I had a habit in those years when I was angry of breaking pencils or anything else I could get my hands on, which I'm doing in the car. Those they, years? They drive me back to the studio. <laughs> they drive me back to the studio. The camera crew went to see the executive producer, Gingle, and said, Salsman's flipped out. You've got to talk to him. Dan comes in, and I'm, I'm still in this terrible mood, very angry, very disgruntled. He says, let's go over to the Chinese restaurant, get some tea, you know, trying to calm me down. We went over there, and he said one thing to me. I'm, I'm still very angry and very upset. He said, just tell me something, Salzman. How many of these procedures turn out to be benign, and how many turn out to have cancer? I said, I didn't say anything. I just looked up, the sky opened, the sun came out, and I was euphoric. I said, this is, of course, this is fantastic. She had a benign tumor. That's eight out of 10 procedures turn out to be benign. The radical mastectomy would have been a terrible mistake. This is much better. It raises the hopefulness at the end. In fact, as I looked at the day, if that had been a radical, I think this whole audience would have left. So I felt fantastic. I was euphoric. I was ready to go back at the editing. I came home. I was very happy. And then that night, I saw myself in the mirror. And I looked at this person who 
a few hours early, instead of saying, wow, it's benign, this woman doesn't have cancer, was so obsessed with the show that he couldn't see beyond that. All he saw was he didn't get what he wanted. And I said, I don't want to do this anymore. I don't like the person I've become. I don't like, I don't like that person in the mirror. USC had offered me a job teaching here. Barbara was ready to resume her career. I went home been a, and became a house husband while I was at USC. Barbara went to the LA Times, became daily calendar editor and, and the chief breadwinner of the family. And I felt great for those two years. I felt like I had just turned a corner. And it, I can't tell you how it was to look in the mirror and see somebody I didn't really know and didn't like. And that's what this documentary did to me, actually. It made me leave uh, documentary production, come to USC to begin broad to start the broadcasting sequence. And then I went back into television in years to come, did a lot of other things. But you just you have to be obsessed to do these shows, but it comes a time when you have to just say that's enough. I didn't mean to go on for so long. I didn't even ask you to tell that much. That is wonderful. I, Adenberg's game and many, many students who have taken his documentary class have carried on that legacy. And I would argue that that person in the mirror is an amazing <laughs> person. Uh, and, sure, yeah. And that the ending of that movie was the richer for, as you say, right. all the women who would be afraid to go find out had that to hope and that to hold on to in those statistics. So it, it really was. When you see it, it's so intense that I think if we didn't have that, it's benign and her happiness at the end, it would have been just a terrible program. Well, Sandra, what, what is the legacy of this film to you in terms of the entertainment field? We see so many doctor shows on. How do you see this continuity? Well, it's so interesting and, and congratulations. I mean, this is a timeless film. We actually work with television writers and producers to get accurate health content into TV storylines. So think of all the t top scripted shows in Hollywood. Medical shows like Grey's Anatomy, Private Practice, the former ER, Mercy, and crime shows, CSI, Law and Order, SVU, um, Numbers. Um, think of children's programs or Spanish language telenovelas. We work with all of these shows to get accurate health content into TV storylines. So, you know, in thinking about breast cancer, one of the things, we have a partnership with the Writers Guild of America West. And a few years ago, we held a panel at the Writers Guild for writers on breast cancer, and specifically on the genetic determinants of breast cancer, the BRCA gene. I'm never sure if I'm pronouncing that correctly, B-R-C-A. And we had a cancer survivor on the panel, as well as surgeons, um, oncologists, you know, all different clinicians, the best in the country. And we usually get uh, 75 to 100 writers in the room for these panel discussions. What resulted were two major storylines, one on Grey's Anatomy and the other on the show ER, which is now off the air. And it, they were both stories about women with the BRCA genes who had to make the decision about whether to have prophylactic mastectomies. So these are healthy young women, they don't have cancer, and they have to decide whether or not to have their breasts removed because they have greater than an 80% chance of developing breast cancer. So if we can, I'd like to show you just a three minute clip of this um, segment from Grey's Anatomy so you can see what it looks like today. Do you have that ready up there? It should be ready. Good, I think we should get my head out of the picture. No, I think we're, well, I think. I'm not thinking oh, yeah. about the time. You have to turn the volume up a little bit. Yes, we did. Okay. So when writers get interested in these topics, we take um, the experts right into the writers' rooms. So they don't have to go anywhere. And we spend an hour with them. And they get to ask questions. Our, our experts, we coach our experts in telling stories, real stories of real people and case studies. And this is what inspires the writers. We never tell the writers what story to write. That's their job. But the most important thing is we actually measure the impact of these TV health storylines on viewers. So in this case, um, we did two studies. We looked at knowledge, attitudes, and behavior one week before the story aired about the BRCA gene and breast cancer and prophylactic mastectomy. What did women know? What were their attitudes? And had they ever taken any actions, like had mammograms? A week after the story airs, we do a follow-up questionnaire. And so what we're doing is measuring the change. So here's what happened. When we looked at viewers who had seen the episode in ER, 
There were huge knowledge gains. We measured also the viewers who had seen the episode of Grey's Anatomy. But what was really interesting is that we also measured the effect of viewers seeing both storylines. And what we found is that viewers were 10 times more likely to report that they scheduled a breast cancer screening after seeing both episodes. So we know there's a kind of dose effect. Anyway, I, so that, that's the kind of work we do at Hollywood Health and Society. But, but there are still issues probably that aren't so easily covered. What, what do you run into there? Well, we, you know, we work on really all health topics across the board. Nothing's off the, off the table. But you know, we look at things, we, we do a lot of work with um, topics that are associated with stigma. Um, one thing we know, one of the top rated shows had an episode about um, sexuality and reproductive health. They were allowed to say penis on air, you know, 20 times during a one hour episode with no problem. When they tried to say vagina in this episode, the network gave them a limit. They said, you can only say it twice. <laughs> so the writers are very creative. So they came up with a, a little sort of nickname. I think they called it something like Vijayjai or JJ or something like that. But you can see that we still have issues. I mean, that's ridiculous. And that was recent, actually okay. very recent. Is there, if you were making a documentary today, Joe, would there be an issue that you would take on that you think is still in the shadows that would be, have you thought about it? Oh, no, I don't think like that. I let my students think like that. Oh, good. <laughs> there are well, a lot of social issues you cannot see on television, you don't see much of, uh, and a lot of people of color uh, stories that are not being told, a lot of uh, stories that are only considered uh, for publication because the white males are still in control, most of the networks. Is so, I mean, that there's right? lots of stuff. The white? I'm kidding. Oh, there's uh, lots of stuff that could be done. If, yeah. and if, but if I were young, I wouldn't be doing it for TV. I'd be doing it for the internet. Because that's where I think your big audience is. I make an argument for TV. <laughs> we actually use the internet as well. We use transmedia. But what we know from the health style survey data is that nearly two thirds of regular viewers of television, and that means people who watch two or more times a week, report learning something new about a disease or how to prevent it from TV shows. One third of those viewers take action on what they've learned. Now, by use, going through TV, you are going into people's living rooms and you're reaching the people who are not even asking the questions. These are the people who are not searching the internet for answers and they're not going to the doctor and they're at disproportionate health risk. Mm. So TV's the great popularizer, popularizer and it's really the way to get into people's homes. Then we, we do what we call a, a transmedia approach. We ask the network if we can air a PSA at a dramatic plot point during the TV mm -hmm. show. Mm -hmm. We refer viewers to call in hotline numbers and to web links to credible sources of information. And we track the traffic and there are huge peaks. One thing we know is that viewers are multitasking. So during a show that's aired from 9 to 10 p.m., there are huge peaks in people searching the internet, going to the sites we refer them to during that hour. Huh. That's, really That's interesting. Uh, one of the other things I noticed about your clip versus this, and then my own personal experience with my daughter, in your documentary, the men were doctors. All the doctors were men, mm. except for the psychiatrist mm. who, uh, who got it. Um, in your clips, there were all these women doctors. Right. Um, my daughter's oncologist was a woman, her surgeon was a woman, and her plastic surgeon was a woman. Mm. And, it, and I just realized that I hadn't thought of anything of it. They're all at Stanford and top people, but I had never thought about that gender issue until I looked at this documentary and how things have changed. So it's true. things changing all the time. Anyway, we don't have a lot of time, and I want to open it up to the audience for questions for Joe or Sandra. Um, anybody have any quick questions? Yes. Piggybacking off of your comment about the female doctors and male doctors, did you, did you find any female doc, female surgeons when you started? I mean, it all, it was all men, they're all from UCLA, I take it? Is that well, in the 70s, you didn't find many women doing, I couldn't okay. even find a female camera crew, which I would have loved. <laughs> Uh, they didn't have any, and I didn't, I didn't, uh, I was, the, the UCLA doctors who contacted me were all men. Okay. There weren't any women involved. So if they had a female surgeon, nobody introduced her to me. How many cameras did you have in that? One. 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 Yeah. Very oh. tricky shooting. I was going to say, in that operating room, yeah. um, 
course, now with CSI and everything, we'd be right down there in that breast. Uh, way more than we really want to know. Uh, there was one scene, I don't know if you remember it, with the close up of the hands and the steam coming out. CBS wanted that out of the show. They felt it was too graphic. It was a little much for me. The cauterizing? Yeah. 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 But I that's me. <laughs> you, know, I um, you set up a microphone, I see. Ah. We can pass it to anybody. Would anybody else like to offer up a question? Yes. Back here. What's the survivability of those who were in the documentary? Have you tracked them at all? Boy, that's a hell of a good question, that's except for problem. Gina Thompson, who I have kept in touch with periodically. Uh, one of the women, uh, the one that's outside, she has this hairdo that she kept every year calling me up saying, I'm so sad. I the blonde my... hairdo, that yeah, thing? Yeah. Oh, I'm great. so sorry I had my hair done that way. <laughs> I still wake up screaming because of my hair. And uh, she called me almost every year for maybe 10 years, mm -hmm. and, but I haven't heard from her in many decades. Mm -hmm. So I don't know. I'm hopeful that they all are still alive. But you know, now, now they'd be in their 70s, 80s, maybe even 90s on a couple of them. So I, I, I don't think many of them are still with The attitudes of not wanting to tell your children uh, that one, I mean, I, I, or, or showing your husband, or I mean, it, things have changed so dramatically mm -hmm. since then. Mm -hmm. The idea that you wouldn't tell your children that you'd lost a breast or that you would, had had cancer is, I don't know. Maybe I love that woman that talks about dating. I, I thought her comments were just tremendous. She had a great attitude. Yeah, yeah she did. <laughs> yeah. Um, anybody? else out here have a no yes joe joe i, I just wanted to ask you and i'm sorry if i missed this she's determined to get i'm this sorry point. if i missed this but, but what compelled you to do this documentary it's it's yeah, like a very it difficult i'm sorry a group of ucla doctors saw my rape show and said gee we why don't you just do one on on breast cancer and i said no over and over again but uh i'm glad i did it obviously as i said in my opening comments it was a major show in my life and I'm glad I did it but uh, I didn't want to do it again the National Organization of Women which had just started was so rough on me on the rape show I mean I had to they were picketing the station I had to go out there and convince them I was the one to do it it was an elaborate uh, all two day event with them to try to get them to understand I was going to do it and I didn't really want to go through all that again but uh, I'm glad I did weren't they in the credits for this one? yeah the National Organization of Women. Four women. Four women, right. They, yeah, right. They were originally, <laughs> nobody knew what it was. It was this weird group. Yeah, four women. Uh, no, they, were, they started really becoming quite powerful back there, and I insisted that we consult with them on this show just to make sure that they were happy with it, and they were. Anyone else? Yeah. Yes. I just wanted to say thank you for the documentary and um, particularly for fighting to um, portray the woman examining herself because I think without that it's still sort of vague and it's not something that people take action on or um, know what to do with the idea um, and then when you made it explicit it was it was really helpful. Well thank you very much it's very interesting because I convinced CBS to let me do it based on that one or two second shot in steam bath and I never talked to the management much after that because I left but I just wondered how they felt when they were watching the show at home and they suddenly see this breast come on for what five minutes and I don't think they thought that was going to happen so our society is so screwed up with this though wasn't it uh, Janet Jackson who had the wardrobe uh, malfunction and was and the FCC fined I mean it was a little bit of a nip and you know we go crazy over this. I mean, we have no sense. It's no wonder that people are afraid to look at a breast exam because they can't disconnect from Unless the Unless you other. watch HBO, they don't seem to seem have that many people <laughs> with a breast talk. And actually, overseas, in, in Brazil, there was a wonderful uh, breast self-exam PSA campaign oh. sponsored by the government featuring one of the lead actresses um, from television. Fabulous. She's nude from the waist up, does a self-breast exam. It's the most natural thing in the world. In Brazil, it was just no problem at all. When was that? Uh, ten years ago. Ten years ago. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Now, <laughs> after this show came on, everybody wanted to do their own breast cancer series on news and, and uh, everywhere else. So it kind of opened up the door, I think, for a lot of people to do it. They could say, well, CBS do it. Did it. Why can't ABC do it? Yeah. Why can't NBC do it? You know, so that was a, one of the results. 
Anyone else? Yes. Again. Wait for the microphone, please. <laughs> Thank you. I somewhat recall, I was quite young then, All in the Family <laughs> had an episode where Edith had breast cancer. Yes. Or maybe I'm making this up. No, you're not. Was it at the... S- did it... I forget which, which one occurred first. Did your documentary occur before All in the Family was on? All in the Family. Oh. Edith had breast cancer, but yeah, it was that after was, this. That was after uh, <laughs> Betty Ford and, and Rock- Mrs. Rockefeller had cancer about, a, oh, maybe a year after the show went on. And I think them talking about it also had a great effect in having people talk about it. And then, of course, the Archie Bunker one. But I think that was in, I don't, I don't remember the date, but it was considerably after. Yes. Have there been any similar updates? Well, you know, I worked for Art Uline. He's the was the doctor on television. Oh. You probably don't remember. I do. Him. Oh, well, yeah, because we're well. at that age. <laughs> no, <laughs> I don't think many of the students know who Art Uline is, but he was one of the first doctors to ever do medicine on television. He was awfully good, and uh, we did a sh- we did many shows with I did many shows with him, and we did an update on this where we actually showed reconstructive surgery. Mm-hmm. That was in 1980. 80, 86 or 87, so it was like 12 years later and showed how everything had changed. But I haven't seen much, well you would know more than I do about documentaries on breast cancer, I haven't seen many uh, recently, so I don't know. And it's, oh, one more thing, there's a big controversy going on. I, I see on, uh, I talked to a woman who just finished a book on breast cancer and she said there's a big controversy similar to 1974 <laughs> with radical mastectomy on the indiscriminate use of chemo and radiation on breast cancer. She's very upset about this and she's writing this expose in a book that's being done much too much and much too extensive and concentrated a dosage. She says it's very similar to the way people were angry about radical mastectomy in 1974. So maybe there are, are controversies that should be looked into. When you're going through it, and I was going through it by proxy, you're hit with so much information and, and you're, you know you should study it and you know, but you're just numb. And I think it's such a, it's, that is still a problem. You, you have all of these options, and options are so traumatic when you're facing this. So it, it really, any, the more information, the better. The more of these that we get, the better. I just applaud you, and thank you so much for Thank you your all service. for coming. Thank you. Food upstairs. Join us for a reception.